I'm here with my co-founder, who's right there for me. I don't know if you guys are <laughs> from uh, We are uh, the two co-founders, and we still run uh, a nonprofit called Our Research. And our research is dedicated to helping the cause of open science, uh, helping usher in a world of universal open science. And uh, we do a bunch of different projects for that. Um, the two that you might have heard of are called Unpaywall, which Heather is nicely representing for us with her shirt. And um, which is a database of all the world's open access scholarly um, papers. And another thing called Unsub, which is a tool that helps libraries uh, walk away from their big deals and save some money and also help put that money into open access. So those are kind of the two big things that we're most focused on right now. Um, we've been doing this as just kind of a little bit of a quick background for, for our organization. We've been doing this for uh, in the ballpark of, I think, eight years. Um, and um, we uh, got kind of, we started in kind of a fun way, um, thanks to part of the guy who is next to Heather on my screen, uh, Cameron Nyland, who was actually putting together a, a conference, uh, a workshop. And both Heather and I went to the workshop and she was a postdoc at the time and I was a PhD student at the time. We'd kind of known each other a little bit from uh, peer reviewing. Uh, I had peer reviewed one paper, Heather's papers actually. But um, there was a hackathon associated with the workshop. And so me and Heather joined the hackathon and we were working together on this thing. And, um, and the, the kind of hackathon sort of ended, but we were still really excited. And her, me, and this other guy were just going crazy, working, working, working on this project. And we were in the hallway because they kind of closed all the rooms and the hallway was like totally empty. And it was like completely, you know, in the middle of the night. And then people started like walking by in the hallway a bunch, like waiters and stuff. Like, what are these people doing in the middle of the night? And it turns out they're like <laughs> breakfast. So we're like, okay, well, I guess we did that then. <laughs> and so, um, so that thing that we built, which was called Impact Story, went on to get a couple grants and it became uh, our day job. And so from there, we kind of like said, branch out and doing some other projects. Like I think a lot of y'all may be familiar with, um, you know, you kind of, when you get a grant for a thing, you're like, all right, great. Well, we do that now. <laughs> it's sort of related to what our original plan was. Um, so in the course of that, um, you know, because I think I, I kind of mentioned that story about our roots, because, you know, we always kind of like that sort of hackathon ethos. That was a, a big part of, you know, what what we both enjoy and how we work well. And we always kind of wanted to, you know, I guess that's sort of in our in our roots or our DNA, as they say. Um, and we always kind of wanted to keep that. And, and so as we started to grow, as we started to get more money, we thought, you know, um, it was sort of natural for us to not say, OK, let's hire a bunch of people and get to be a bigger and bigger company. Um, and do a lot more admin and, and managerial stuff, um, we still wanted to kind of do the hackathon stuff. And so um, we thought, well, one of the ways that we can sort of do that is if we maybe don't grow so big as a company where we have a bunch of HR and stuff, but instead we, um, uh, instead maybe we can hire some contractors, right? And they can help us with specific things uh, and they can kind of just handle that part of it and we can continue to do what we like, which is, you know, I don't know what we've been doing, which is a kind of a combination of talking about things we're passionate about and writing code. And so, um, so that's what we did. And so I wanted to just kind of walk you through um, some of the things that we did. Um, we felt like it worked. We feel like it's worked pretty well for us. I mean, who knows? You guys can be the judge of that. Like if we're wildly unsuccessful, then maybe this is uh, exactly what you should not do. But since you're here, I, I figure we'll, we'll tell you a little bit about what we did. And then um, I'll take about 15, 20 minutes for that. And then I want to basically like throw it open and hear from you guys uh, what y'all have done with contractors, you know, what's been good, what's been bad, or some lessons learned. It's, um, we did something kind of like this at the last J Rost, uh, like I think it was about two years ago, right, Heather? Two years ago. And uh, it was just the funnest thing ever. We had a terrific time. <laughs> we learned a bunch from, from everybody. And it was just really neat because, um, you know, we're in a weird space. And we'll, I'm going to talk about it in my, the session later this afternoon, but like, we're kind of in the like sort of startup space. We're like, oh, we're trying to do a new thing. We got all this great technology that we're building a thing, you know? But we're also very much in the nonprofit space, which has a really different kind of set of cultural values, right? It's not like, hey, I got the new latest and greatest thing. Everybody like, you know, smash the opposition and stuff. You know, it's way more like, hey, hand in hand, working together, singing Kumbaya around the fire. And like, we both love, Heather and I both love both of those worlds. Um, but it can be really tough and it's tough to find good advice or people who are living in both, <laughs> or from people who are living in both those worlds. So one of the great things about JROS is that a lot of y'all are living in both of those worlds. And so that's kind of why we want to hear from, from you guys a bunch, which I'm doing a great job of by talking endlessly. So it's super, it's like eight o'clock in the morning here, which doesn't sound that early, but I am not a morning guy. So I got my coffee and I've got my morning person co-founder who is going to like uh, poke me when I'm like going on too long and stuff or just being an idiot. So, okay. 
So uh, I have got a link to this Google Doc in the um, in the chat. So spoiler alert: there's not. I'm not going to. There's not going to be twists at the end of it or anything like that. Um, but I thought that if we wanted to, we could keep some notes on that or not. I don't think this would be the other great thing is we got kind of a small group, and so I think we don't have long. Um, but I just wanted to kind of start off like, what are um, and if you don't want to look at the Google Doc, that's fine too. There's nothing amazing on there. But I just want to kind of think, uh, recap a little bit the benefits for us about doing the contractor thing. Uh, a huge one is less HR, so our human resources, obviously. So, you know, just there's a whole bunch of stuff that comes with hiring people. And we've done it. We have one employee, so we have hired a person. So we know a little bit what we're talking about, slightly, about <laughs> hiring. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's a bunch of work, right? I mean, there's a bunch of stuff about, you know, what is your, you know, your employee manual and your vacation days policy and just a whole bunch of, just a whole slew of taxes and blah, blah, blah. So it's great to not have to do that. So that's kind of an obvious one. That's one of the things that draws a lot of people to subcontracting. Um, another one I think specifically for our, our space is pretty good is it's flexible um, with grants, right? Cause like a lot of our funding comes from like, it's really different from like, oh, we sold a hundred widgets this month. So we made $10,000 and to 112 widgets next month. It's like, it's not like that. It's like we made up half a million dollars this year and we made nothing, we're gonna make nothing else for two years, right? And maybe after that two years, we'll make $2 million or maybe we'll get nothing. So my and Heather's salaries, and we think we talked about this before, but like me and Heather's salaries have, you know, we, at one point we were making $20,000. At another point we're making north of $100,000. And so it's like, well, just really widely varies based on how much money we have. Cause sometimes we got no money at all. And we're just barely trying to make ends meet. That's been a little while for us now, thankfully, but like we may be back there again. And so one of the nice things about the, the, um, the contractor thing for, for our specific context is that we can, um, yeah, you know, we're not, we're not, someone's not planning their entire life around, you know, our revenue levels, which like I said, can fluctuate a lot. Um, and then finally, I kind of already mentioned, we can stay small. So it's good for us to be able to, um, for me and Heather, for our particular style of working is we're able to be kind of fast. We don't have to have these all hands meeting where we're like, hey, everybody, the direction of the company is starting to change. And, and we've got a bunch of people who are like, wait, what? Like you're changing the whole, like, what are you guys doing? Do you know what you're doing? If me and Heather are like, oh yeah, tomorrow we're pivoting to build this new thing called Unpaywall, this new thing called Unsub, maybe we don't know exactly how it fits in our mission statement, whatever, we can just do that. And it's not, we don't got to convince a bunch of people, which is, has been nice for us. And that may be a disadvantage, right? That maybe have, that maybe has held us back from like being as focused as we should be. I don't know, but it's worked for us. Um, and I'd love to hear other people's kind of, and I guess I see some, there's some stuff about the advantage and disadvantages already. Um, and there's some great stuff about disadvantages, which I think would be great to talk about. Um, and I should have had on this list, but I think I'm just going to go straight though into um, our concrete um, experience to get that out there so that then I can kind of stop talking so much and, and listen to you guys a little bit more. Um, but I think there absolutely are a ton of disadvantages. It's not all uh, sweet sunlight for sure. So I, I should have had that on there already. Okay, so um, next up, uh, just in terms of like, just kind of background is where do you find subcontractors? And there's a bunch of places, but um, I'm just gonna hit these three again. I really wanna focus on our concrete experience because I'm not any kind of big expert in this, right? I'm not like a subcontractor management certification expert or whatever. I know what we've done. So a lot of things me and had always trying to say, hey, look, make it concrete. And then, then at least you've got one example, right? Like, um, so yeah, so what we've looked at is like apps and services that are basically built specifically around doing one kind of subcontracting. So Heroku is one of those and Heroku is basically, uh, they call it a platform as a service. It's sort of like Amazon, it's built on Amazon web services, but it's another level of abstraction above that. So in other words, a lot of what you would do about server management, uh, what, what people call DevOps, um, they do that for you. And so when you're like, oh, we gotta like bring on another server, right? If you've got like Amazon servers, even though it's cloud hosted, that's non-trivial to try and split your app across different servers to try and kind of scale horizontally. And one of the nice things about Heroku is that's just like a lever. You just move the lever. So it's, it's a really popular uh, app for people getting started with, with projects. Um, people generally kind of move away from it as they get bigger. We haven't moved away from it as we've gotten bigger because it's been a really good way for us to outsource that DevOps stuff to Heroku. And so it's expensive, but we look at it as, okay, well, we're kind of paying, we could pay Heroku a bunch of money or we could hire a staff, like a DevOps person, probably someone of our size would. Uh, just to give you a sense, like our server bill is like, you know, because you have a good number, like a, a ton, like twenty thousand dollars a month, something like that. Like, I yeah, check. that's right. Yeah, thirty, I think. Yeah, yeah. more. Yeah, it's, so it's we're paying more than a person's worth in um, salary. Our organization is three people for what it's worth right now. Yeah, plus yeah, a bunch of subcontractors. 
so that's kind of we we kind of looked at it as a as a basically a competitive advantage for us is that you know it's a lot easier for us to deal with Heroku move that slider up than it is to talk to our DevOps person and say well we got a lot of pros and cons we could move to a different architecture and blah 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 and like we don't want to think about that let Heroku do it yes we know it's expensive but it's not we're not looking at it as hey this is a really expensive way to interface with Amazon Web Services. Instead, we're looking at this is a really cheap way to hire a DevOps person. And I think that that mindset has, has made it look like an appealing option for us. Um, so then there's uh, two like kind of markets um, where you, and I'll, I'll talk about these other ones in a second, um, but you there's two kind of markets that we've used for hiring subcontractors. One of them is called Upwork. It used to be called, I forget what it's called. It, you, how do you have no name? But- um, Odesk. Odesk, thanks. Seth. Um, it's called Upwork, and uh, it's just this massive like online marketplace full of contractors from all over the world, subcontractors from all over the world who do stuff like code design, um, subcontracting. Oh, thanks, Tim. Um, uh, for Tim's got the link of Roku up there. Um, but uh, yeah, a whole bunch of different subcontractors. Mostly, uh, we've been interested for code and design work. I think they got other stuff on there as well. Um, and it's a really nice, uh, smooth interface for for finding just a bazillion people who are qualified job. And they got the whole ranking system and stuff like that, which has been helpful for us. Um, it's an, another thing where it's like, it's a, you know, it's a two-sided marketplace. So they kind of handle um, payment. So you pay Upwork and they pay the person, Upwork takes a cut. Um, and that has had the advantage for us of, again, like we don't have to think about a lot of that, those details. We just pay Upwork their money, Upwork handles the rest of it. Um, and so that's been, uh, and people can bid on it and stuff like that. So that's, that's a tool that we've used. Um, and we use that a lot and we've had, I think really, I would say really good experiences with it. Um, not like a hundred percent good, but I would say 90% like really solid. And the last one, a lot of you have probably heard of called Mechanical Turk. And this is um, a thing from Amazon, been going for many, many years. And the idea is it's similar to Upwork and that it's a double-sided marketplace. So they've got people with tasks and they've got people who will do the task and Amazon is the broker in between. Um, but it has the difference of the tasks are generally like very small and very discrete tasks. So one of the like common uses of Mechanical Turk is people who are trying to train big data sets for um, machine learning uh, tasks. So for instance, like, you know, you get those owners like in Google where it's like, Shh, click on all the pictures that contain a cat, right? If you have a ML algorithm, you're trying to train what a cat looks like, it's a good Turk project where you can show it to 100,000 people and they can all click on whether it's a cat or not. And then Mechanical Turk is an interesting one. And uh, I'll come back to that again when we kind of talk about our specific um, use of it, because there's definitely some pros and cons to do with that. Okay, so jobs that we have uh, kind of, like I said, outsourced. So DevOps, I already talked about with Heroku. So I don't think I got a lot of other things to say, with that, to say about that. I'm happy to talk about it more if, if folks want to talk about that more later on. Um, DB admin, same thing. So we have um, with Heroku, uh, they have another product that's like a database product. And it's the same thing. So a, a DBA a database admin is something that a company our size would normally have. Um, and uh, to handle things like um, uh, to handle things like uh, uh, sharding the database as you grow, to handle things like backups is a really big one. Um, having like a backup plan, you know, and restoration plan, um, handling uh, lots of performance issues where you get bottlenecks in the database. So those are all things that we've had one pointer uh, that Heather and I have at one time or another dealt with, and they can be just awful <laughs> awful times where it's just like oh my gosh this is so stressful and like we've got all of this you know we go through 130 million records or something like that we got to spool through these records just super fast we go through them in a, in a day or two and so we've had these awful bottlenecks where it's like for like a couple weeks nothing happens while we just try and learn databases and it's not fun so what we've often done in that situation is there's kind of a, a startup motto i think some people was just like just throw metal at the problem right like it's metal like the computer the metal computer runs on is cheaper than developers and so we look and we say hey look what's me and heather's time worth to like learn everything about databases that's that's worth some actual money our, our momentum is worth something uh our happiness is worth something right if we can just spend more money on the hardware and maybe we're not optimizing all the details about this just right but uh we can get back to doing the things that we know about and we're good about so that's kind of what we've done with with the same thing with Heroku and with databases. So we generally use database. We kind of are on database hardware that's significantly more capable than we probably need. We could optimize it in a lot of ways. And our approach is generally like, we're not going to optimize that. That slows us down. We could hire some, we don't know how to do it that well. I mean, we know a little bit about it for sure, but like we're not experts at it. We could hire an expert at it, but now we got another person who makes $100,000 on the paywall and blah, 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 blah. Like, 
So at all of the disadvantages I can already talk about the hiring people. So it's worked really well for us. And we've, we've been super satisfied with the approach of like, let's just throw metal at the problem, problem goes away and we can get back to shipping product and learning, right? And actually doing what we're good at. Um, so yeah, so legal, um, it's kind of an obvious one, like obviously we're not lawyers, so we're gonna need a lawyer. Um, we had really good luck with um, a lawyer though. Um, should I say her name? I don't, I think it's fine. Yeah, for sure, definitely. Yeah, um, sorry, go ahead, Heather, you're there. Yeah, we should definitely say her name. Yeah, um, yeah, her name's Caitlin, and I forgot her name of her company now, what's it called? Uh, Brevity Legal. Thank you, Brevity Legal. Anyway, we can, I'll, I'll put the link in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Beth. Anyways, but whether her or not, like the main thing is we actually spent some time looking for lawyers who specialize in startups because we wanted someone who would kind of see what we're doing because, you know, we figured we got a lot of special startup -y stuff going on and we don't want necessarily someone who's like also helping you write your will or whatever. And um, so, yeah, so we, we searched for a couple of them and we found a really good one. And um, we found them on a site called Zoom Law, I think, uh, which is another kind of marketplace for lawyers. Um, yeah, up legal and it doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. But hopefully something like that will exist again or does exist now. Yeah. Yeah. It was exactly. like it was like upwork, but for lawyers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So we've had good luck with these and, and she's been fantastic. Like she's kind of a younger, like up and comer type of person. She hasn't been like in the legal profession for a super long time. Um, but what was great about it is that she um she just like went like to war for us. I mean, she was like extremely focused on us. And yeah, we definitely had to teach her a lot about our business because as you guys know, scholarly communication is super weird. And you guys have probably all had the conversation where people are like, wait a second, the authors don't get paid for their papers? Like, you mean they write all these papers and they get nothing? It's like, yeah, no, that's exactly right. So we had to kind of walk her through a bunch of that stuff, um, but she was super, she really, she was really smart. And so it just, it worked really well. And so I would, I would give us a slight plus one to like someone who's kind of young and doesn't have a really big practice who is gonna like be able to focus on you. That was a really good fit for us. Um, and a lot of the stuff that we have her do is um, particularly uh, around like writing terms on our website. So because we deal with a bunch of publisher stuff, there's a lot of legal stuff around that. And so it's been really nice to have kind of like that like level of like legal cover above that. Um, and again, we just, we don't have to think about it that much. Um, and then also negotiating. So we do a bunch of negotiating contracts with people. And at this point she knows our business really well and we can like hand a bunch of that stuff off to her because the negotiating stuff is really stressful. And it turns out to be, there's a lot of like nitpicky terms about indemnification and stuff that like, I don't know, like, I don't know what the chances are that we're going to get in trouble about this. And if we are, I don't know how much coverage we need and blah, blah, blah. It's like, it's just stressful. So it's really easy then to just send it to Caitlin and be like, hey, Caitlin, what do you think? You know, and she, of course, she's a lawyer. She's generally going to kind of like err on the side of caution or whatever, but that's been really good for us. So um, uh, for accounting, it took us three tries. <laughs> we're, we're on accountants that we like now, but definitely like our first thought was like, look, we're a nonprofit. We should get a nonprofit accounter in accounting, you know, like they got all different rules around them, right? So we found hired a nonprofit accounting. They're real nice people but they did a terrible job for us, like just really bad. And um, cause they just didn't, they were all of their business was on like, I don't know, like, like small, not like churches and like soup kitchens and stuff and like great causes, maybe better causes than us, but like different than us for sure. And so, you know, we're dealing with grants that need all of this special, um, what's the thing Sloan needed with the, they had the, the money needs to be in a special tracking account. And they had all these different like accounting rules and, these folks didn't know anything about that. And so we ended up being behind on a bunch of our filings. We were like, great, it's handled. Like, we'll just outsource it. It's like the advantages of outsourcing, it all works great. And like, it didn't work great. We ended up not filing a bunch of stuff that we needed, to, uh, some 990s that we needed to file. And so um, basically kind of, we checked up on them. We're like, oh, like crap, like we're not doing, <laughs> we're, we're doing really badly, like, cause they're not doing their job. So we fired them. Uh, and we're like, okay, good. Now we want someone who, uh, and we have this kind of weird thing of like Canadian and US operations because uh, we're based in Vancouver, um, but we're a US um, nonprofit. And so we're like, okay, good. Well, we'll, have, we'll get someone who specializes in that. That's what we needed. So we got someone who specialized in that. They didn't know anything about nonprofits. And so that ended up being a big problem too. And we didn't like ride hurt on them enough. We kind of hoped that it would all just be taken care of. It wasn't all taken care of and they were late on some stuff too. So then we fired them and we got one more and this one was an interesting one because they marketed themselves as a virtual CFO, not as an accountant. And um, that it seems like has made the difference for us because they look at it as a much more full service thing. Like we were looking at accountants as great, all of the accounting is taken care of, we don't want to think about this. And that's not how they were operating. That was at the, at the end of the day, I think it was sort of our, our fault. Um, Cause we weren't like riding her them cause we thought they were going to be more than they thought they were going to do. So these virtual CFO people have been really good um, because they kind of wanted to do more stuff and that's what we wanted to. 
Um, and so I don't know, I think virtual CFO is honestly like a bit like um, grandiose on their part because they're not doing a bunch of stuff I would think a CFO would do, but they're definitely doing more than our accountant was doing. And they didn't really know a lot of nonprofit, but they were willing to learn. And so that was like, that has like handled, and we also like rode hard on them a little bit more this time. And so that would be kind of my tips on, I guess, accountant or whatever, like just ride hard on them. And it's not fun, but you got to do it. Um, okay, so QA data entry. Um, so yeah, so we have like these enormous data sets. A big part of what we're doing for Unpaywall is, like I said, we're trying to find open access copies of things. And um, and uh, a lot of times, you know, we've got an article that, that someone comes to us with and we're supposed to say, here's the open access version of that article, but we're wrong, right? We say, oh, this article called All About Birds of the Falkland Islands is like, matches this other article called Falkland Island Birds. Like we think they're the same thing, but they're not the same thing. They're from a different author or whatever. So we're like, there's not a really good way to check that other than like using the human eyeball. Like you got to look and see like the algorithm thought they matched. So we can't check it with an algorithm. That's the whole problem. So we said, okay, this is a great opportunity to try and like get a bunch of people behind this. So we'll use Mechanical Turk. So that's what we did. So we've put like an enormous amount of resources into building these tasks for Turkers where the Turker gets very, very clear instructions of like, I want, you know, you're going to look at this article, you're going to read the title, read the author, read the abstract. I don't, I'm, that they, uh, these aren't the exact instructions, but it's something like this. Anyway, and then they compare it to another article. Are they the same article? Yes or no, they tick a box. So I think dealing with doing Mechanical Turk is really a whole session uh, in itself. So I'm not going to dig super into that, um, but it has worked pretty well for us. I guess I would, a few quick tips I would say is that, um, the instructions need to be fantastically simple, like extremely, and you definitely got to iterate on the instructions. They really need to be simple because the triggers are looking for ta tasks like, is this a cat? Like very, very straightforward. And I mean, they're regular people, they're sm like smart people, like all of the people here, right? It's just, they're used to doing a certain type of task. Um, so that's one thing is that, you know, if you want to do something a little more complicated, you got to walk them through it. I got three tips on this. Um, the second tip is that, um, there's a bunch of forums where Turkers kind of congregate and talk about the jobs. And you absolutely, if you're posting a lot of Turk jobs, you absolutely are being discussed on those forums and you're getting a reputation on those forums. So we generally try and pay attention to that and see what the Turkers are saying about our jobs. Like, are we being a good employer? Are we doing a good job? And interact with them there. I mean, it's not secretly there, but we're trying to say, okay, great. Well, how could we make the job better, right? And in the early days we're like, oh yeah, like they had a bunch of problems with how we were doing it. We learned from that and we're able to improve it. So I would say definitely like get interact with them. And the last one is sort of an ethics thing, right? Like there's a lot of like ethical questions around like there's a lot of folks. I mean, it skews towards people in uh, you know developing countries who have a lot less money and they're working for a lot less. So you know the normal I think hourly rate on Turk is super low, right? It's like three bucks an hour or whatever. It's just whoever's making your socks are probably making the same type of money, right? It's the same as that that kind of globalization issue or whatever. So we just kind of decided for us, it was kind of an ethical thing of like, we would pay $15 an hour to all the Turkers. I think some people would say, okay, well, that's maybe still too low. Some people say that's too high. For us, that was just kind of the level where we wanted people to be paid at. And one of the effects of that is because that's much more than most Turk jobs. Um, a good thing about it is we've got tons of people to pick from. Kind of a bad thing about it is that if, um, if someone's not doing a job, which happens from time to time, um, it's like, it can be a really big issue for them because this is like an extremely lucrative, like source of money. Our jobs are very lucrative. And if people kind of, they don't do a good job, we're like, oh, sorry, you're not doing a good job. If they were, if it's $2 an hour, they're like, okay, whatever, I'll get another job. If it's $15 an hour, they're like, no, what's wrong with it? It's like really good. So that's like, there's definitely pros and cons. And, and so that's, that's our experience with Turk and I'm happy to get into that more if you want. Um, the other ones are pretty quick. So um, for HR, we have this company called Trinet, which we heard about at JROST last time, which was fantastic. Um, but yeah, they just, they handle the HR. I, I don't think there's a lot else to say about that. And, and across different countries, which is amazing. Yeah, so exactly. if you've got people in different countries, they'll handle all that in the medical and the payroll, I think if you want. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. 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 So they kick ass. We, we like them. A, I like them a lot. They got this whole web interface thing. It's actually like pretty good compared to lots of B2B stuff. So Big fan of it of, of trying to they get back to me like in a day, like always in a day, like they're great. Um, maintenance. So we did hire some people. So this is, I think, kind of specific to again, nonprofits is we get these grants, and the grant says, here's two hundred thousand dollars, make a thing. That's a common like pattern for us. Um, and then the two hundred thousand dollars runs out. And then what happens to the thing? Right? Like me and Heather are off doing some other thing, and we don't want to like make this, you know, make so an example is this tool called Depsy. It doesn't matter what it does. We got paid by the NSF to make a tool called Depsy. We made it, 
and then the money's gone and where does the website go right so in theory well the website just stays there right it just keeps doing whatever we did it worked before it'll keep working in reality of course that's not at all how it works like the second you stop touching it it starts falling apart like piece by piece so what we decided to do and it's worked super well for us is we hired this guy on upwork his name is casey and he works uh we spend uh we're spending a little bit more, but we're spending about a thousand bucks a month. Is that right? 500 bucks a month now um, on a couple different projects that he's maintaining because it's only like a few hours a week. Um, but he knows the code, he understands the code base and he just keeps them running. He spends a couple hours a week on it. And that couple hours a week, of course we could do it, but um, it just, it's just cancer for our focus. You know, like when you're trying to manage 15 different projects, we manage basically two projects right now and Casey manages the rest of them when people ask questions, hey, we want the site to do whatever. Casey can either say, sure, I can do that. It's a five minute fix or well, our grant money's out. So I'm sorry, like, and that's where it's just, we've, that has been like the most wonderful thing because we used to maintain them all ourselves forever and it was just awful. So um, data scraping, um, that one, uh, the data scraping and the data cleaning are both things again that, um, that we can do with, with Turk. So we're, we're using Mechanical Turk for some of those tasks in both cases. Um, the other one that we're using is something called for data cleaning, something called X Plenty, which Heather knows more about than me. Um, and so I'm not going to dive deep into it. And Heather, if you want to talk about it for a minute or if you want to just keep moving, up to you. It's a service that helps you transfer data from one place to another place, where the one place is an Amazon S3 or an Amazon database or Google BigQuery or spreadsheets into somewhere else. And there's a similar list. And it, it automates that some um, and makes it easier to maintain. And so therefore, we don't need somebody whose job is that because we pay X plenty to do that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a nice service. Um, and then finally, sales. Sales is a really interesting one um, because a lot of the advice you hear as a startup is don't outsource sales. You want to be doing the sales because that way you're hearing from potential customers what it is that they want. And so when I say sales, of course, you know, we're a nonprofit, but we, we try and make earned revenue to, and we do make earned revenue to try and, you know, support ourselves. Um, and it's been really good for us to do most of the sales, you know, and, and I, I think that's a really good pattern. I would say don't outsource the sales early because when you go try and sell it, that's when you see people's eyes, right? And you see them either light up when you, you know, talk about one aspect of the product or you see them like just bored out of their skulls when you talk about an aspect of this product. So that's really important feedback. And so I really like um, have, doing the sales, but once we had done that for a while and we really kind of understood, and we like in the case of Unpayable, we've been doing it ourselves for like two years, we're still doing some sales on kind of some smaller stuff. And again, it's a lot of paperwork, a lot of negotiations and it's boring and we're not learning much during it. Um, and so we hired a guy um, from a company called VA Partners. Um, which basically handles sales for a bunch of other things. And it's been a really interesting experience because like he sells everything. Like one of his main customers is like rental trucks, which could not be much further. Again, great business, but like pretty different from what we do. And so, but it's great to see him kind of work. And he's just like an old school, like kind of sales guy. And he's like, you know, let me sell you a great truck. Oh, you're going to sell Let me sell you a great unsub. You know, like he's just he's happy to sell whatever. It's, it's, it's a truck. If the web app that helps transform Skyline communication, all the same to him. Um, and the great thing about that is, you know, it's uh, he, he knows what he's doing and he can handle like the day to day negotiations, especially because we're now selling to libraries. And if you have any plans to do that, get ready for enormous amounts of back and forth, like just just hour after hour of hour of like negotiating on fine points of details, which I'm not not slagging off libraries when I say that. I mean, a lot of cases they've got a bunch of if it's state institutions, they've got a whole bunch of state regulations around them that they have to deal with. Other times they just enjoy doing it. I don't know, like it's it's not a good or a bad thing. It's just a thing and it's a really big time suck. And so it's been really good to have him doing that for us. So what we haven't done is uh, we haven't outsourced social media. A lot of people do that. Um, we enjoy it. And also it's really educational for us. It helps us kind of keep our finger on kind of what people are thinking about the product. Um, key sales, uh, we still do that. Um, so important sales that are a lot of money or we, we feel like we can learn something from it, we still do that. And it's great. Like Steve, who is our sales guy, is, is really cool about that. And we're just like, hey, Steve, we're going to take this one. And he's like, okay. So that's worked really well. Um, and yeah, the core code, uh, we still write um, the main, like the, the code for most of the, the stuff that we're focused on, we write the code for. And that has kind of keeps it in that hackathon place for us, um, which has been nice. So that's, um, that's me talking for longer than I had planned. Let me stop talking. I'd love to hear you guys. Does anyone want to chip in and talk about disadvantages of um actually do you want to do you want to cover that now jason we could cover that now some disadvantages of um 
contractors. I think one is you don't get that team spirit that you do when you have a, a big team. There's something to that that you don't have the same way. Um, others want to chip in with dis disadvantages? Yeah, maybe I put this hi, it's Joe from Africa Archive. Um, yeah, thanks for bringing this up. And I think, it, as you rightly said, I think everything has its pros and cons. And this team spirit is a nice thing, but it's actually more or easier to to bring to life with a smaller team as compared to have a decentralized remotely working team. Like as with Africa Archive, we're also envisioning to bring that like across the continent and to, to bring Africa Archive to life in different places on the continent. And for that, of course, we need key people in the team in each of these spaces, but we cannot build a huge, you know, empire state building kind of thing um, with, where everybody can come together for coffee once once a day or something. Um, so yeah, I think I answered my own question. So, and what, what I put out there is like, but yeah, basically what Jason said, has pros and cons, but I, I totally buy the pros that you laid out. Um, you speak very fast, but I'm sure you know that. So, <laughs> Sorry so about that. English speakers is a little, what? But, okay, I got that, like, what? I missed that. Damn, <laughs> but no, but yeah, what is that made a lot of sense and I think I'm getting most of it. Thanks. So I, yeah, thanks for, I just wanted to also thanks for sharing all of these learnings with us. Oh yeah, no problem. So hi, I also wanted to really thank you for this really great session. I remember me, uh, seeing you the last time was actually at JROS. Uh, and, um, and we also touched on this and I just wish there were more people at this session because it's just so important to see how how could we organize this as a community because you guys have, have put so much effort in to, to find and source some of these, you know, these resources, this expertise that you don't need to have uh, internally, right? So yeah, there are some uh, great places uh, what were you calling the Upwork and, and, and Trinet and others. So, but you know, if we really want to have a like a diverse scholarly communication landscape, there are so many small players. And we're in the middle of this um, OA Diamond study right now. We also see there are so many small publishers, uh, less than one FTE, and they really need um, support, technical support, copy editing support. There are all sorts of areas where, you know, how could they buy in, uh, uh, I mean, they're, they're often using volunteers, but if they're going to purchase, uh, you know, where do they go? Um, then I'm also kind of toy toying with the idea is like, okay, sometimes for big tasks, you have to hire somebody, but then you've also got the communities of practice that you could also join where you could kind of learn on the go more regularly if it's not such a huge uh, thing, yeah? So, um, but how could we uh, perhaps, so you were talking about this, uh, This uh, it wasn't a car salesman, but a truck salesman who was yeah. helping you with the sales, right? And you yeah. were saying, oh yeah, he can like sell anything, but it's like, okay, brilliant. He can sell your stuff. There, I'm sure there are plenty of others in the scholarly communications field, right? Who need sales support. So how can we put this brilliant guy in touch with others who also need this, yeah? So this marketplace that you were talking about I just don't know whether, I don't think there's a scholarly communication marketplace for this kind of thing yet, is there? I think that's what we really need. Um, and, and it would be great because our lawyer, for example, she knows all about Elsevier now. Right. <laughs> because right. because we hired her when we were very and a very much smaller than even now and uh -huh. i think a, a bit like you're saying these very small people often very small groups often their big break is when they get to make one big contract with one really big entity well that's a really asymmetrical contract situation right so that's a real time when you want to bring a lawyer on board but you haven't got that experience so if we could go if we could have a short list and people could sort of go to the same we wouldn't right. have to re-explain doi's all the time <laughs> yes <laughs> right, right. To, to the salespeople or the lawyer or whatever. And one yes. thing we've always thought is that digital science, for example, sort of embodies this a lot for the for-profit closed mm -hmm. source world, right? Because they've got a marketing team, they've got accountants, yes. they've right. got, right? And so that's a real advantage, I think, um, that they have that we don't have. And so yes. I so I love the, so the 
original Jay Rust was a little more like tools and building focused. And I uh -huh. think that there's an advantage to not losing an aspect of that. Cause I think there's a bit of the Jay Rust group that has some specific needs in this area and it would be nice to distill it and have a place that said like I don't know how to do it very well everyone wants to start a list nobody maintains it so I don't know how right. but yeah I don't know how to do it very well but one way is if you guys ever have questions you're welcome to drop us an email and say hey who do you use for accounting and and yeah, what would nice. you look for in an accountant right and maybe if we could even just have a I don't know <laughs> yeah I know that that is really great but I'm kind of thinking how can we really support the sector um, more broadly, right? And how can we connect? And okay, you know, some of those accountants, they won't be the best and you also have your stories, but you know, how, how can we uh, make sure that some of the smaller players, that, that they don't get too frustrated and spend their precious time and resources on things that they don't need to do and that they could get from elsewhere, right? So by maybe, uh, yeah, other organizations trying to look after that or to, you know, I'm also not 100% sure how exactly we might do it, but gathering already the needs of, you, you've got already a great list here, yeah, uh, and of course it all depends on what kind of service you're providing, um, but still, um, gathering the needs and then, you know, connecting the dots and, um, yeah, I'm excited by this. Uh, I'm, I'm quite inspired to think, oh, it would be great to have like further conversations about it. That sounds great. Other thoughts? Other thoughts? No, just chip in here. Um, so I, I wanna come from this perspective less from the perspective of managers of projects and more from the workers' perspective, the labor that we're trying to contract. Uh, so one of my big concerns is that this is all precarious labor. Um, and especially when we are, um, uh, for the kind of labor that we might need that has some domain expertise in the sciences or in knowledge infrastructure in general, um, uh, the question is whether we can go beyond um, the flexible labor schemes uh, to make, li to make a livable um, career for, for, for folks that we want to uh, source labor from. And so uh, this is sort of the other side of what um, Vanessa, you're just talking about, um, is that in a sense we need we need labor pools that can help um, uh, folks who are who are doing flexible labor get enough of it um, that they could make you know. So I know way too many um, really good copy editors who are living hand to mouth, and 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 we exploit them relentlessly, and we and, and we benefit from their skill. There are often people with with uh, with uh, masters and PhDs, um, and we exploit them. <laughs> and so the question is: so, so in a sense, we, we need some we we need to, uh, uh, some way of organizing this labor so that it's both uh, easier to find for the for the organizations, uh, but also more livable for the people who are doing the work. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a good point. How how good a job do you feel like the? So in some ways, the academy is like is a system that's trying to do that, right? Do the, the whole kind of concept where you sort of have your apprenticeship at the end of it, you've got a PhD. And then at the end of that, you've got a tenure job for you. In a lot of ways, it feels like yeah. the academy has failed to fulfill that promise. And so yep. do we have examples of, so it, in my mind, and I'm a ex PhD student and like yep. <laughs> dropped out of the academy part because I was like, this isn't working. <laughs> so yep. um, do you think we have examples? So I guess part of what I'm gonna, it feels like the academy, which is, in some ways built to do exactly what we're trying to say has yep. totally failed at that from my perspective um do we have examples of people who are succeeding at it that we could emulate um i don't know I, and as it also as an ex-phd um, i'm also thinking of uh, the failure of the university to um uh like we're, we're like the, our big example right now is the university and it's a, a use of flexible labor and yeah. how problematic that is and yeah. so, um, what I what I don't want to I, I don't know if we have great examples of what you're talking about. But what I'm worried about is that we're extending the logic of of you know the flexible university, um, and that's uh, and we've got more and more PhDs out there, um, uh, or even PhD dropouts like us, um, who've got a lot of knowledge and who are struggling. Um, yeah. So. Um, I, in a sense, we've got to figure out. So for me, this is social reproduction. 
if we if we need specific kinds of knowledge and and specific kinds of people, we've got to think about um, beyond from we've got to go beyond manage the management perspective. I think the area where it hits the road for um, this kind of session is that we're we are mostly talking about very small organizations, yep. and there is not steady funding for yep. our organization, and so. Our employees, so I think yeah. it is would be misleading for us to try to hire people and promise them steady employment when we ourselves are not don't have steady funding. So I'm yeah. not sure our area is the one to focus on um, for that. That said, there are things we can do. We make sure we pay fairly, as Jason said, and so on. So um, that's our that's our approach right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, and, I, and I absolutely understand. Like flexibility, as somebody who ran a journal, I, I absolutely needed uh, to pay as little as possible to get certain jobs done. Um, I, even you know, fi and figuring out how to do this, I, I I understand that. So the question is, like, this is the infrastructure behind the infrastructure, which might be labor infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, and that's what, in a sense, we need to figure out how to um, how to think about while keeping these vital projects going. I know how hard it is to. Uh, yeah. with these small projects. Well, it's absolutely something good to be keeping in mind, and I appreciate you bringing that up. Okay. Yeah, on that note, I um, I shared in the Google Doc, um, we've talked with um, fair work dot, no, fair dot work, not a com or something, and, and they've developed principles to ensure fair pay across the world, and we are all like globally envisioning at least um, organizations, or most of us, um, or work in international teams and remotely, very much so during pandemic, obviously, but also beyond. So yeah, this is maybe something that that feeds your narrative, Timothy, and to look at. And I mean, yeah, for us with every guy is also super diverse. The conditions, the countries, the political context, the taxation system, we we need to consider is it's super diverse. And for that, we also will need to hire legal expertise and, and taxation expertise. But yeah, it's, it's encouraging again, like Jason and Heather, thanks again for sharing because it's encouraging to hear that. I mean, like we can also adapt that in an African context for us. So uh, like it doesn't have to be, the, but it can as well be American service providers. And I also agree that we should look beyond the ivory tower for, for such services because the expertise is in the market and yeah, but also as uh, Vanessa said, like, let's make it work for academia and our academic services as well. And let's find a way to streamline the knowledge that we're building as we uh, develop. So. Yeah, great. And we've got uh, two or three minutes, I probably something left. Anybody who maybe hasn't shared yet wanted to maybe weigh in on something that they liked, didn't like, thoughts? Can I, can I wave at something? Sorry, I completely crashed out and my computer's decided to fall over. So I'm um, speaking of outsourcing. Um, it, it's just two things. One thing that Joe was saying and one of the responses I had earlier is think that the challenges on for our, on our side has always been short-term contracts are tough because you want someone who can really hit the road and actually do the work in the time. And so you need someone who already knows your stuff or you need to define pieces of this that are so modular that it's, that it's hard. And so then that idea of having a pool of people that have been recommended by other you know, people in the space is really appealing, um, which is just a capital question in the end, right? This is all just all down to down to to capital and the ability, the, the lack of our ability to keep people available over time, so they learn the spaces and and perhaps for us to do better at coordinating our technologies a little bit as well. Um, but then, as Joe was speaking, it just re resonated with something conversation of Vanessa and I had a couple of weeks ago. Was, again, how do we build these networks that are actually global? And one of the reasons we can't build networks of global is because those capacities, we don't have, we can't build the networks because we don't have the networks. But um, again, it's a capital question, right? Maybe there is the way, that's the way to solve two of these problems in some ways is to actually consciously build those networks of capacity so that, you know, there are a bigger team of people in Africa who are ready to do these things and, and work on these issues. And that really starts to resolve, you know, that, capacity problem in terms of building these tools of having those tools be built not us building them but having those tools be built by people for instance in that context or southeast asia or or in a you know a, a not well endowed liberal arts college in um in appalachia or whatever it might be um 
those two things seem to connect in my mind, the, the networking piece, the value we could get from internal recommendations and the capital that might help us keep people on and connected and learning those systems and, and the, the, the steps along the way. Yeah, may I chime in again, Cameron? Thanks again for yeah for, for highlighting this and and again Heather and Jason, I appreciate like for you to to just balance this the payout irrespective of where people live because the reality is that life is more expensive in Africa and in Southeast Asia because distances are longer, infrastructure is not there, people lose time on basic things that we take for granted in Western countries and cities. Um, so life is more expensive as a matter of fact. So we should actually pay more in uh, in the global south, which you know we don't have the resources for. So, but but to pay equally um, is is a good start. Is a, is a yeah is, is leapfrogging basically. Hey, thanks, Joe and Cameron. I wanted to dive in because I think we're about to get cut off in a second here. Um, and say I think that um, reusing people is is great, and I think the networks are great. But I also don't want to get lost that we don't need that. We don't need that. We didn't have that. We used people who'd never done this before. And I think there's lots to be said for you do the job yourself as the co-founders, right? As the people on the ground, you do it yourself until it's too much. And at that point, you've normally got enough money to hire somebody, not always, but right, you don't have enough money, but at that time you still got sort of the time to do it yourself. Then hopefully as it gets overwhelming, you've got the money and then it does take time to train them, but it's possible. And I don't want us to get caught in this chicken and egg until we've got this network it doesn't work we've actually made it work with subcontractors and teaching them and like one of the people who knows the most about citing scholarly um software is Casey who is like uh, does this for three hours a week so in the world you know what I mean so just that <laughs> and I think there's something to be said you're not success you don't need to growing a big team isn't what makes you successful. And so just to decrease the prestige around that and and say, and as startup world is that to be slow to hire, be slow to hire. I think there's lots about that like approach that's got value. And that's one of the things we wanna send you off with as well, I think. <laughs> and this has been a great discussion. I think we probably have another hour of, of stuff to talk about as we're digging into how we can do better at this, what's good about it, stuff like that. And I, I've had a great time and I think it's a good good sign when I feel like I've got a million other things to say and we're out of time. So, um, but I think maybe we should uh, we should end it there if that works for everybody.